Good evening, and uh, thank you for, for coming uh, this evening. Um, I'm Milton Curry. I'm Dean of the School of Architecture here at USC. It's a great pleasure to welcome uh, new students, returning students, new faculty, returning faculty, uh, alumni. Uh, we have Board of Counselors members here. Great to, great to have them here. And also Architectural Guild members as well. So it's fantastic to welcome you um, this evening to our fall 2019 uh, public events uh, series. USC Architecture is a dynamic uh, platform for educating and inspiring citizen architects, designers, and scholars to analyze problems and create design solutions that both respond to the challenges of our time and embrace the promise of a better built environment. For 100 years, this is our 100th year. Wow. USC architecture faculty and graduates have pushed the boundaries beyond traditional, uh, have pushed beyond the traditional boundaries of the field to pioneer many paradigm shifting practices of architecture. And you know many of those uh, movements and individuals uh, that are graduates, uh, the case study house movement and a number of other uh, movements and graduates who have moved through the school. Our lecture series this fall is comprised of an eclectic and electric uh, group of practitioners, technologists, conservationists, uh, designers, and museum directors. Uh, our lecture series poster is online and is posted around the school and around the university. Um, please take advantage of these. It's an opportunity to uh, be face-to-face -face with people um, who are thought leaders and be able to ask them questions uh, as a freshman, as a faculty member, as an alumni, um, and that's, that's really uh, a dynamic interaction that you can't repeat online. Um, so please do come to all, we've got seven lectures and one major symposium uh, that we're doing, so please avail yourselves to, to all that great uh, conversation. Our Dean's Creative Talk series is designed to place us in conversation with interdisciplinary thinkers outside of the field of architecture. And I'm pleased tonight to welcome uh, Michael Govan uh, here to start off our series and to start off our public events uh, event series. Uh, Michael is the CEO and Wallace Annenberg Director of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, better known as LACMA. From 1994 to 2005, he was president and director of the DIA Art Foundation in New York where he spearheaded the creation of DIA Beacon, uh, an amazing uh, museum uh, in Beacon, New York, up the Hudson from New York City. From 1998 to, 2000, from 1998 to 1994, he was deputy director of the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum and worked with Guggenheim branches in New York, Venice, and Bilbao, working very closely with former Guggenheim director Thomas Prince. Prior to that, he helped found Mass Mocha while at Williams College, where he also studied art history and fine art. Since coming to LACMA in 2006, Michael has overseen uh, the transformation of the 20-acre LACMA campus with buildings by Renzo Piano and monumental artworks by Chris Burden, Michael Heiser, Robert Irwin, Robert Kruger, and others. At LACMA, Govan has pursued his vision of contemporary artists and architects interacting with the museum's historic collections and the community, as evidenced by exhibition and gallery designs in collaboration with artists John Baldessari, Jorge Pardo, Franz West, and architects Frank Gehry, Fred Fisher, Michael Maltzen, and others. He is now completing fundraising <laughs> for... <laughs> uh, what I should be doing tonight <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> You never know what we'll Yeah, you never know. Yeah, raise your hand. He is now completing fundraising and schematic design <coughs> for LACMA's $650 million expansion by architect Peter Zimtor. In addition, Michael has ambitious plans for satellite locations that vastly expand the museum's footprint in the sprawling county of Los Angeles. Please join me in welcoming Michael Govan to USC Architect. Um, we're going to cover a few issues this evening. I know we'll get to the Zimtor building. Um, 
I'm going to ask Michael to give a brief overview of LACMA, and then I'll ask him uh, increasingly tough questions for about <laughs> 35 minutes, and then I'm going to open the floodgates to all of you. Um, so please um, have your questions um, ready. There will also be a reception immediately following uh, this conversation right outside in the outdoor courtyard. Um, I want to start by, um, yeah, asking you to just give a brief overview. I think for many uh, of us, um, LACMA is both a close neighbor, but also, um, you know, it's a big place. And so, particularly for new students and folks who are here, it'd be great to have you kind of walk through the history of the site and of LACMA. Uh, thanks, Gene Curry. It's really nice to be here. I, um, as I say, I prefer to be at school than working. So it's cool to be here, and there are a lot of friends here as well. Um, you know, we, LACMA is such a huge organization. We're the largest art museum in the Western United States. We have 150,000 artworks. We have dozens and dozens of exhibitions every year of every kind of art. It's an extremely, if you haven't been to LACMA, it's an extremely diverse program. Um, all time, all place. I see one of our curators here responsible for all of that. One of, I think, 37 PhDs we have working at LACMA who are, um, who are thinking about how we can create a museum for the 21st century. And uh, LACMA was, I want to get to the architecture part since that's what we're going to talk about tonight, how that embeds a sense of being and what we are. But uh, we're a young museum, right? That, um, you know, if the Metropolitan Museum in New York was, we're, it's got 100 years on us. We were only really situated on Wilshire Boulevard in 1965. And that youthfulness gives us a really different spirit than a lot of other uh, art museums of our scale, both the tumultuousness and the newness of building and tearing down and LA finding its way, but also just a different point of view. When, when we started in 65 as a art museum that would have art of everything, every place and time, even though it didn't start with such a huge collection, um, we were also showing living artists in Los Angeles because it was 1965, you know, and we were here. So uh, it's a, it's just got a different vibe, and that was what was so attractive to me about this place. Um, you know, this thought of discussion about encyclopedic art museums and what they are, and you can really. I mean, today, people are tearing apart that notion of the encyclopedic art museum of the 19th century, partly because there's no such thing. How can you encompass everything? <clears throat> it's not possible, and when you make an encyclopedia, you have to be very careful how you make it, because it is a worldview. If you start with Greece and Rome and Europe, and that's your worldview, that's like not the LA of the present, for example. So um, I like to think of it instead of encyclopedic, because that encyclopedia is always changing anyway. It's always changing. I mean, every museum is over time, what was considered art or in the encyclopedia has always changed. But I like to think of it more like anything goes, that we can have the broadest programs, that we can move from design and decorative arts and film. And uh, we have, as I always know, we have forks and spoons in the collection. We have architectural drawings. And so that notion of anything goes or anything's possible Obviously, there's a coherence and a thoughtfulness that curators put into it. But I think that's sort of this spirit of this openness. And in a way, we're not, I want to say this in the right way, we're not bogged down by our success. <laughs> that, you know, because LACMA was last chasing to keep up or even approximate the, the scale and power of those East Coast Europe looking museums. Um, we, we don't have that. We don't have the Greco-Roman temple facade. We don't have the deep collections in one area in that sense. So in the 21st century, with a different outlook on the world, um, <clears throat> we can be something fresh. And uh, it's like a metaphor that, uh, you know, so our architecture is kind of falling apart too early and we have all kinds of problems, which is why we're tearing down the old buildings. Um, Whereas the mat is very solid, but you know, they can't get Wi-Fi through the walls. We're made of paper. <laughs> There's an advantage to being uh, uh, less well built. It, only in the sense that people and time changes. So whatever you build that's made to last has you fixed in a particular time. I mean, of course we can adaptively reuse things, but you know, I'd like to say that a Greco-Roman temple facade as a museum front is not you know, not appropriate 
for our time. And so luckily we didn't have one and we won't have one. And so we have to think about the metaphors involved in that. And I, I'll just show a few slides just for fun on the architecture. But um, you know, I like to start with looking at LACMA and the Pleistocene. <laughs> when, when I did the show of LACMA's new building in 2013, I wanted to start with this painting that's owned by the Natural History Museum, not by us, by Charles Knight, one of the great uh, artists. Uh, this is 1925, it's 50 feet long. And it, you know, it's not that real, but it's it, it sort of, you know, it's this idea of thinking about the fact that actually art is being made in this time, right? We find cave art We've been predating when humans started art. So this is time of art. It's not prehistory. Um, and as I say, art's been along for a really long time. Museums, not so long. They're just a frame, and they arrived late. Art will go on beyond museums. So that idea, and then our site, this is the La Brea Tar Pits at the turn of the century. So by this time, by the way, the Metropolitan Museum already has a huge collection it's, you know, I think it's got its temple facade, Greco-Roman temple facade, it's quite large, and this is what LACMA looks like. I'm joking that LACMA looked like this, but this is our site. I note, so everybody remembers, this is Los Angeles in 1922, right at LACMA. That's our corner, that's where we are on the lower right today. Um, that was 1922, two airfields. But, eight years later, that same shot looked like this. I mean, do we remember, do we know, do we understand how fast Los Angeles changed? But of course, in this timeline, LACMA has not yet arrived, just to, again, the sense of youth. And it wasn't until 65, till the um, <clears throat> William Pereira buildings, Bill Pereira buildings were built uh, with these pools that mimicked the tar pits and this uh, mid-century look. Uh, you know, I don't know who knows the story of this, but the director, Rick Brown, at the time was absolutely certain that he wanted Mies van der Rohe, and Mies van der Rohe was excited to come to Los Angeles and build LACMA. But the major patron, the board voted unanimously, um, but the major patron had veto right for the $2 million, $3 million gift, and so he exercised that and a big board discussion ensued, and um, everyone knew Bill Pereira was a good architect, city planner, living in LA, and so it, even the press reported, you know, a good second choice. Um, but there were problems from the beginning, actually. The, um, this is the postcard of that sort of dream of mid-century Los Angeles. Uh, um, and as Ed, Ed Ruscha's painting shows, there was a lot of controversy even with artists, even then, about what that institution was and what it re represented. And I, I do note that there were major problems right away, that the, tar, the uh, pools leaked, uh, <laughs> the fountains would get people wet, there were a lot of compromises in the design. So there was very well known and discussed that it was a compromised beginning. But there it was, and there was a pride of Los Angeles in that beginning, even if there was, you know, a sort of different way of looking at it. And then the eight, nothing much happened until the 80s, and actually this is when LACMA falls a little behind because MOCA has risen to, to take the challenge of contemporary art and LACMA catching up. And I, anybody who's an architecture student has, I'm sure everyone has an opinion about the 80s and this particular <laughs> moment. Um, Music was great. <laughs> Music was great. Yeah, we were going to play some on the DJ stand over there. Uh, so this was constructed, um, this sort of neo-Egyptian uh, 80s thing, um, which is Hardy Holzman Pfeiffer. And, and d just to be fair, there was a much more ambitious plan. We have a picture of it at, at LACMA right now, which was to encase all the buildings in a similar thing, to connect all the galleries, and because of money it was never finished. So we don't really know how it would have totally worked out had the Hardy Holzman Pfeiffer total plan worked. I will make a note though, and it's just a note, that in the 13 years I've been at LACMA, um, and you know, everybody's known this problem of these buildings since Rem Kool has in 2001. I haven't received a note, an email, a letter, like about this building coming down. And, and I think that's partly stylistic and maybe the style will come back later, but style or not, what the building did is it created a wall on Wilshire Boulevard, 90 foot tall wall. And it, the, the attendance sort of stayed stuck sort of from that and you couldn't see what was inside. So the whole new plan for LACMA, urban light, the open plazas, um, was to create a different 
vibe of openness. So whether you like the style or not, there was a there was a question about this idea, and they did it because of the pools. And then um, you know, there's a lot of opinions about Bruce Goff's uh, Japanese pavilion, pavilion for Japanese art, which is weird and wonderful example of organic architecture um, that was built at the same time. The building dates back to the 70s, actually, and because it burned down and then was rebuilt, and Goff never saw it finished, Bart Prince finished the building. And it is being lovingly restored right now. We're spending about $6 million on its innards to make sure it goes into the future. Um, but the plan, even in 2001, LACMA faced this question of what to do with the jumble of buildings, the unfinished Hardy Holzman Pfeiffer plan, uh, the tar pit still seeping into the building, no seismic, no methane barriers. We sit on three faults, two faults, and level five methane. Uh, so these are actually not even safe buildings. And even then, the trustees decided in 2001 uh, to run a competition to extend LACMA, but the winning entry was, people may know, Rem Koolhaas, because Rem Koolhaas showed the museum that the buildings were in such bad condition that they really ethically shouldn't expand, but should rebuild the old campus. And I had this plan on my desk, and actually went to see a patron in LA because I was a friend of Rem's at that, just generally about, you should build that. It's kind of a great idea to rethink an encyclopedic museum in the 21st century with the way people visit museums now. Um, the plan was not funded. It received a lot of opposition from media and from many sources. And it hadn't really been worked out, like the idea on this roof, this tent roof. He says, well, you change it every 20 years for maintenance, and like, that wasn't really cool for the museum. So they never really worked it out. But that idea of, like, of, of rethinking the totality, what an inspiration that you think of the frame as malleable because art and attitudes change, and you don't have to think of the museum as a fixed thing. So it was quite an inspirational idea, and the presentation was amazing. Um, anyway, Lachman didn't do that. And Eli Brode, uh, who you may know here, uh, gave money for a pavilion that would be built exactly as Rem Koolhaas said it shouldn't be built, but as an addition. Um, and then when I got to LACMA, the thought was, well, we are eventually going to have to close and tear down those buildings. And one of the reasons nobody wanted to do that was because you didn't want to close the museum for five years. You really lose your attendance. You're like, we're the, we're, there isn't much like LACMA anywhere else. So I proposed to the trustees that we build the Resnick Pavilion, therefore doubling the size of the museum so that we could, in the future, close the old building. So this was a little controversial. Aren't you here to fix the old buildings? And it's like, no, we need to do this because it will be a long period. So um, we redid the campus. I don't want to talk a lot about that because people have probably been there. Uh, the idea was to open it up to public sculpture, gardens, uh, the entry pavilion. You know, I changed Renzo's designs with his permission to put art out front, urban light, to create an open air plaza instead of a glassed in plaza, to put the tickets in the bar outside, to have jazz concerts, to create like a space of event and a place with that public sculpture. And that's kind of worked. And you see the May Company in the background, um, which we made a collaborative deal with, the, uh, which was built by AC Martin. <laughs> beautiful building. Um, adaptive reuse possibility, for sure, and uh, beautiful building. And so the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, as you know, um, we made a, a collaborative deal with them to put that museum there, lease the property forever, and we're working closely together, and Renzo's doing that. So maybe before um, before entering into kind of the phase you're in now, which is the Zumtor uh, phase with, with the expansion, um, just to kind of pause and ask, you know, what do you think that you're doing, or how do you see LACMA relative to um, you talked about the Met, but MoMA obviously is is doing a major yeah. expansion and kind of reconsideration of right. existing buildings. Um, is is your vision and your implementation here with the Zoom Tour building and the satellite uh, campuses or right. entities, is that democratizing the collection in a way that's different from other institutions? Well, I, I mean, I think, listen, the, it's funny because all this thinking about um, change, it, it, it comes from decades of thinking in academia about the way hierarchies need to be reassessed 
dismantled, reorganized. We've been talking about this in theory for a long time. Now, what does it mean to take all that theory that's really amazing um, and put it into practice in institutions that are essentially conservative? Right? So, so it, it, I feel that a lot of what artists, friends, colleagues, art historians have been thinking about, these things are fairly obvious, that mm -hmm. existing hierarchies are no longer relevant in the same way. It's not a question of quality or not, it's a question of dominant hierarchies that came out of the structure, that came from Europe and all of that. And then, I think to add to that, my experience at Mass Mocha, which was in a depressed New England town that was, um, where the idea is the museum could play a role in, in vitalizing economy and life. And then the Dia Beacon project got me very invested in the relationship between the museum and everyday life and urban planning and thinking more broadly of possibilities, also of efficiencies. You can build, I mean, in Beacon, you're gonna build with a different budget than you're gonna build in New York City because the expectations are different. It wouldn't be appropriate to build a Renzo Piano building on the water there in the same way. So you see the efficiencies of sharing, you see the growth in audiences and the diversification not only of audiences but of collections and curatorial interest. I mean curatorial interest is just going horizontal all over the place. So horizontal meaning for us mere mortals. Um, or so, I mean, cur curators a, willing to a, 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 Across right. time and across place. Curators of painting wanting to have architects. Curators of mainly historical art spending their time talking with artists now. Uh, curators wanting to have dialogues between Asia and Latin America because there are dialogues in the 18th century and 17th century and so the idea is let's put that together. Um, reversing hierarchies of taught and self-taught. Like, so curators are going places that we um, wouldn't have seen previously. They're not thinking within their boxes of this notion of departments where, you know, this is a department and that's a department. And then it's very funny how those, you know, we have a department of prints and drawings, but the prints and drawings don't include Asian prints and drawings. They're only European prints and drawings. And uh, the depart certain departments are named for whole continents and then other departments would be named for countries. And then it's all so bizarre. So curators are kind of like thinking, you know what, let's just, and, and I think the other thing is this notion and that's also Mass Mocha Deep, um, relevance to living culture. Like, what's the use of history? The use of history is to take us forward, to find our way, to find out who we are, what is our identity. And so, in a place like Los Angeles, it's pretty obvious that the museum of all these cultural identities has a different role to play where the, those cultures are alive and well, and multilingu many languages are being spoken. So, I think that the, the premise was to take the sort of experimental ambiance of Los Angeles, to take all this theory which is really obvious. I mean, there's nothing we're doing that has, it's like Steve Jobs, you know, put together things that already existed. We're, we're not breaking new ground in thinking as much as assembling it into um, an organization of the present. So that's the big opportunity. And you think about how hard that is if you've got a stone facade, literally metaphorically, whereas if the possibility is there to create a more agile um, structure. So whether you call it democracy or, you know, rethinking this way, because, I mean, it's not like people are gonna vote on the art, but it, it, it's a different kind of people who have access. We know which zip codes don't go to LACMA. And it's not just for reasons of distance, although that's one of them. So who says that a museum is to be in one place when you have hundreds of thousands or millions of people living in areas where there isn't cultural infrastructure, right? What's, right. What, why is a museum a box, a single box? Why is that, what, what, where does that come from? That's not a that's, a, that's a premise to be questioned. But I think what you described, uh, you, you, you describe what you're doing is coming from academia in a very natural, organic way to, and finding its way to the practice of museum making. But thinking of um, someone like Oakley in Weezer, who mm -hmm. unfortunately passed away so uh, last year, um, I'm thinking of Document 11 and, and democracy uh, yeah. unrealized. And that's, yeah. 
and, and thinking how, how does a museum um, in its core um, exude a kind of um, political small p um, yeah. oversight over the curation of heritage and culture and um, in, in what you're doing right now reaching out to the public to have a socialization between a more relationship between communities and the institution. Um, that, that's pretty significant in terms of changing the role of the museum in its community. And speak about kind of why LA is a place where you think that's successful or can have more runway than New York or DC or someplace else. Well, that idea of a museum being more responsive to communities, um, we just have to stay ahead of that because there's actually not going to be a choice. Through social media, through the awareness that people have now of their own voice and multiple perspectives. That pressure is coming anyway as the world changes and there's more access, more information. So us being just talking out, I kind of think that was over anyway. But the, the beauty of LA is, the, um, is this kind of horizontal diversity. I mean, here's a, like a, an interesting idea about if you, if you, instead of having a million square feet on Wilshire Boulevard, which might be to live up to the goals of a, of a East Coast museum, um, let's say we contain that space to a giant experience of three or four hours where you can really see a lot of art, and then instead of adding wings there, you add wings in San Fernando Valley, South LA, um, East LA, and you think about taking the museum apart and putting it in those places. It happens that LA is so traffic challenged and so separated that we joke that we could send the same show, <laughs> 10,000 square foot show with a curriculum guide you know, for local schools and send it to all those places and there'd be no overlap. So that's like that question of how can you take the, the spread outness, the, the, the inaccessibility of LA and turn it into an economic positive for the museum? And of course you would adjust it and change it. But I think that the, you know, it, it, to be the most creative and maybe the most diverse city on the planet is a really amazing thing right now. And for the museum that purports to be encyclopedia, meaning it has lots of things from everywhere, to not want to be part of that future. I mean, like, it's just an even an interesting attitude shift. Um, most, I mean, the museum as we know it, this notion of encyclopedia, it doesn't exist. They're none in Asia. They're none in Latin America in that way. There's not one in Mexico City, a big city. It's a, it's a European idea that wasn't perfected really until New York in the Metropolitan Museum. It's, not, it's, this, it's a European idea, right? You don't, there's no encyclopedic museum in Beijing. So, um, or in Tehran in the same way. So I, I think that this, you have to remember that, but just put it on the West Coast. Think about facing west towards the Pacific, towards Asia, Latin America. Um, look at Europe the other way around. Don't not Europe, look at it, but maybe look at it at the distance through Asia, through, through Istanbul and there, just as a metaphor to just think of a different point of view. And it kind of changes everything of how you think. And so one of the other issues about our present day is since everything's accessible and you can go anywhere, there's pressure for you to be unique, right? It's gotta be worth the trip within LA and within the world. So I think marrying the museum to LA issues, place, horizontality, diversity is just the best way to create, um, uh, even the presentness, that story I told about in 65, we were showing contemporary art. So I always say that it's also easier to teach art history backwards. Last I checked, I woke up in the present. So maybe it's harder to construct the past and maybe it would be even a path educationally to take in art history to work from things you're closer to toward the really hard work of, of, of trying to imagine and construct a context of something very distant in time. And so LA, but LA allows for that possibility of presentness first, um, I think in a way that in an older city, it might be harder 
So I think even that, so, because the lesson is shift of points of view. That's also an academic idea now, right? You, you, nothing's, you can't look at this from one point of view. The more points of view, the more you look at it from, the more different context, the more value it has. So it used to be museums were about telling you the order in which things were made and the order in which they're important, and that's, we're telling you that. All right, that's the idea. It's a hierarchy and you're gonna learn it. And now it's like what questions lead to what's relevant in what context. So I want to ask you about audiences because um, you, you could, <coughs> you're, you're at the Zoom tour, the point of doing the Zoom tour building now, and you could have, um, one can imagine a very particular kind of audience on Wilshire and different audiences in all the satellite entities. Um, or one could imagine a mixing of audiences and all right. of those so that someone who might go to the Wilshire um, the mothership might right. also make a trek because of the institution's imprimatur to South LA or yeah. Crenshaw somewhere else. And tell me about how you're looking at audience development and audience mixing because LA is a place that I've found um, having grown up in Central California but having lived in LA for a couple of years. It's very diverse but it's very diverse adjacent. There's communities that are yeah. not speaking or interacting with one another. Right. I'm wondering how you think the museum will, in a way, be, begin to have places of, of collapse for that. And maybe the museum on Wilshire already is, but how the satellites also play into that. So we work hard at that. I mean, right now our audience is, I think, less than half white. That's been a huge shift. And you do, how do you do that? By the, it's by the diversity of program. It's also by just the openness of the plaza. You know, my metaphor for the plaza when I was talking to Renzo Piano is like there's something clearer than starfire glass, which you spend a lot of money on. He said, what's that? It's like air. If you can walk your dog through the entrance, it's going to be a lot more friendly even than clear glass because you don't have to open a door. So there are a lot of ways. And we do a ton of programming in Latin American art, as you probably know. And every so you're doing that for the Latin American audience. And I was like, yeah, but not the way you think. It's not just to have. It's not that you're looking for the Latin American audience because they want to see Latin American art. Mostly, the Latin American audience wants to see all art, like anyone would. But you have to feel at home. And if you really question people about whether they come to museums or not, they will. A lot of people will tell you, well, I just don't feel welcome. It's not. And it's not like. Um, yeah, it's maybe the glass door, but it's a lot of other things about what's there, what it looks like, what it feels like, what pictures are on the wall, what faces do you see? So you have to do a lot of work to do that. And I would say we're, you know, we're, we're, we're getting there. We're not there at all, but we've seen real results. But those neighborhood issues are also interesting because that's a question. Do we want our neighborhoods to diversify and homogenize with them, or do we want a patchwork of more intense cultures, right, that are concentrated? And it's a constant push and pull between globalism and local and regionalism or localism, even in a city, right? Because we live in a surfing culture where everybody's free to connect cultures, but that's because each one of those cultures that's being pieced together has credibility. And if it happens too long that everything's mixed, does it all become without identity? So I think our, we have to, there's no answer to that except the push and pull of the locality and the intensity of Koreatown or aspects of certain parts of LA that have that and wanting um, cross referencing. We know there's no answer to that. It's a constant uh, stress. To, to bring architecture, we we do want you to put up some images of the Zoom tour building uh, in a moment. But um, thinking about some of the, <clears throat> the ways in which LA is unique as a cultural destination at this moment, uh, of course, there's other institutions like Marciano Foundation, the Hammer Museum, um, Hauser & Worth, which is a gallery operating kind of like a museum in a way. Um, but there's also um, a smaller constellation of smaller presenting institutions, such as Art and Practice, right. that Mark Bradford and yeah. Norton have, um, Destination Crenshaw, which is something else, and also uh, things like Underground Museum. Yep. I wonder how you think about um, the role in which the architecture of those places is playing in their success and the role that architecture can or is playing in the success of your master plan. Well, I mean, first of all, there, if you t we, the more we talk about museums, and there are 
those of us who get together to talk about that boring topic all the time, right? <laughs> the more you realize, would you agree, someone? There's no such thing <laughs> as an ideal museum. There's an ecosystem of very different places that have very different missions that are supposed to, D is not supposed to look like the underground museum, which is not supposed to look like LACMA. And so, just to be really clear, we're not trying to grow, all grow up to be something. And uh, the more difference and clarity of those identities, the richer you know, our environment of world is. And so what you find is that you know, environment is destiny. There's a sort of the thing, places that are successful, usually there's a marriage of poetry to the feeling of the space and the you know, ambition or place in the world. And I was sort of alluding to that, that you know, the underground museum shouldn't hire Renzo Piano. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, when we did Dia Beacon, it was with an artist, Robert Irwin, in an existing building, but, but kind of done at a level two notches above in terms of finish and all of that, maybe sort of the just warehouse you inhabited. And then, and then I think there are places in our, in our cityscape. Um, I mean, adaptive reuse is amazing. I mean, I've spent most of my life in adaptive reuse, but in Bilbao, there wasn't a place to properly adaptively reuse. And they, their dream in Bilbao was to have an identity within Europe and the world that they couldn't achieve without an architecture that was spectacular. And that was what their desire was and their hope and their dream. So it wouldn't make sense to just renovate a warehouse there if the dream is a big shiny building, which they have and it's changed the city in very positive ways. So that, again, it, it's hard because you, everybody wants to set best practices and standards and all of that, but you realize that it's about the, it's like some kind of Goldilocks formula. It's got to be right for the place and the time. On Wilshire Boulevard, we wanted to up the ambition a little because the museum is now 50 years old. Um, it wasn't working. And so it did make sense. And then <clears throat> maybe it's that feeling like it has, if it's LA, it has to have a new attitude. Um, and, and again, even within the museum, I would argue there's no, within, even in a type, uh, encyclopedic modern, there's no typology, which is absolutely good. And, and from the beginning, the idea was um, there's certain art that you want to have in sheetrock rectangles because it's like a soundstage and in Fred Fisher's hands he can rearrange it in many different ways because uh, you can rearrange the sheetrock easily but as I noted most of the art in our collection was made way before sheetrock, made be way before paint on walls in the traditional sense and so the, the, the idea of having half our museum, the Zumtor building being made of fixed walls with concrete makes sense. So then the museum itself has a diversity ex of experience. So um, I mean, it's just a long way of saying there aren't rules. There's, a, there's an individuality to each problem and each, each uh, site and situation. So maybe just a couple of images of the museum? Yeah, I'll just show. So um, this was the show we showed in 2013 where we revealed this idea. And it had to do with the Gettys exhibition on architecture. And they said, well, do you want to do a talk about the new Zoomtor plan? We know you've been working in secret for a few years. It's like a talk. I don't know. I called Peter Zoomtor and I said, are we ready to show something? And he said, let's go for it. So um, my dear friend who's now no longer with us, John Bauscher, who had helped found MOCA and worked with me at DIA, created this giant concrete model in the Resnick Pavilion where the, the, the Charles Knight painting hung. So we went from the Pleistocene through all the history of LACMA, all those buildings to this. And interestingly, um, the concept hasn't changed. It was an organic form with lifted up to open up the park space. Uh, this was the next iteration as it, and there's the La Brea tar pit, I mean, there's the, the Page Museum. Um, you can see the Resnick Pavilion. And so this organic form, why the organic form? Now, one, there were a lot of obstacles on the site that we had to work around, including digs that the tar pits wanted for the future. So when you actually drew the diagram of what space was available, it didn't look like a rectangle. So that was a start. Plus the Goth Pavilion and the La Brea tar pits have this organic quality. And if you really think about it, the most the biggest landmark is the La Brea Tar Pits. That's the clear thing looking from an airplane or from far away that you see. And so we started to connect into that. 
Um, and that's how that form emerged, to take advantage of the space, to avoid obstacles, to connect with the tar pits and the uh, golf pavilion, and to sort of be the opposite of the grid around it. And it also made sense of a kind of messy campus. You know, you had a big thing. And then, um, the well, actually, as we said, we wrote a love letter to the tar pits, but the tar pits didn't love us back. The scientists <laughs> said, no way. Those spaces over here and over here, we're going to dig later. You can't even think of putting the museum there. So we had a problem uh, that they wanted us to actually back off further, and we're still upset about the old buildings from the 60s and 80s. And we thought the project was dead, and we owned this parking lot over here. And two things is Peter Zumtor, uh, two things is, is Peter Zumtor had early on planted a bridge and another building over there, as architects do. What space do you have? I'll fill it. Uh, <laughs> and he had a bridge there, and I was like, no, 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 put that one in the box. That's not happening. Um, and then the second thing was, since the building was already elevated to open up park space, it was like, well, if you can walk under it, maybe you can drive under it. And so that's when we proposed, there was the first design that was not well worked out because it was hasty to create a, a building that the County of Los Angeles and the Natural History Museum would be okay with. So we proposed, let's cross Wilshire and take the space across the street. Be a cool icon, you walk under it, you drive under it, it's more, breaks the grid. What do you think? The Natural History Museum loved it. They went from total negativity to unanimous support. The county supervisor said, now that's what we like, dialogue. You came up with a good, you, you were at each other's throats like two kids fighting in the back of the car. And the parents said, work it out. And you did. So they were happy. And then I got a note from the first day it was, um, it was published, I got this great note from Frank Gehry showing me his 80s design to cross Wilshire at that location. <laughs> Just to make sure I knew, it wasn't a new idea. So he's like, right on, that idea's already been circulating. And so we went with it. And it's turned out to be a really wonderful thing. And so the idea is simply, it's a three floor building. Underground are the things you don't want to see, the catering kitchens and the transit storage. And then on the ground floor, and this is looking from above, these blocks are, you know, the restaurant, the bookshop, this on the park level, loading dock, education space, and then a theater. And then above it is the gallery. So you do the amenities on the park level where it makes sense. You walk in and out. That leaves you the big floor for pure art. Very horizontal. And I required several things of the architect. No facade. No front or no back. So there's no hierarchical entrance. No cultures in the front. No cultures in the back. I wanted it transparent because I had this idea, you know, look out to Los Angeles. Let LA look in. It's time for the museum to tear down its facade, its walls. Um, and so that idea of no hierarchy, lots of transparency. And then the other thing was to make a museum where you could easily rearrange galleries and you didn't have to close off sections. So if you wanted to redo that section of the museum over here, there was another way around. Because if you have a Beaux-Arts museum and you take down the main gallery, you're stuck. No one wants to change it. So I wanted a changeable museum. Those were the requirements. You trust the architect. This is what he came up with, and uh, it's pretty cool. There's just diagrams of how you see. There's also a rect. Every says has curved walls. No, inside it's all rectilinear. This is you take the top off, which is the sunshade, and you get rectangular galleries and then non-rectangular inner spaces. Um, this is just the sense of the form, which is cool. He used an industrial rubber band to create the form, so it has a physics to it because again the obstacles were there. It's more realistic rendering. And then it's a concrete and bronze and glass. But the real thing is about it's, this is crossing Wilshire. The real thing is actually it's three types of galleries. One with light to the outside. We have a lot of sculpture that was made for outside. In ancient times, we brought it inside. So you give the light back. Then you have galleries inside between the blocks. And those are galleries that have low light added spotlight, and then you're invited into more intimate spaces. Now, this isn't a good rendering of the intimate space because it looks very bright and open, but most of the intimate spaces are smaller. So just uh, more renderings of sort of the feel of light and shadow. You'll have curtains, places to sit, um, and maybe just to get to. So again, you have daylight galleries, light from the side, permanent sunrise or sunset, models, 
vessels and things that love light and want to be sculptural. You have this inner gallery where it's light and shadow. He's known for light or shadow. And then you can go into these more intimate spaces. That's the concept. And those are the three kinds of light that the museum wants. So um, that's kind of the idea. Um, let's open up for questions. I, well, actually, I made a promise to freshmen that if a freshman had a question, they, they were. <laughs> I was calling them first. So, does a freshman have a question? <laughs> no. Non Comments are good too. Non freshmen. Su Next. Suggestions are also okay. Sorry, you mean by the same idea that you have a picture and a label or an education program next to it, or that it has to be readable without augmented? Yeah, so, I mean, I don't know if it's going to be exactly what, so, I mean, rather than writing a paper or doing it in architecture, it should be viscerally, emotionally accessible. Um, there's a lot of research and thinking about this notion also of emotional learning, that if you were learning in, it's even in, applied to teaching and other things, and Zuntor's actually been an advocate of that for a very long time, uh, for that idea of how you retain and feel. Um, I mean, we would take the perspective that there's a kind of a paradigm of the Resnick building or the, the other buildings that they're the current sense of the objective Cartesian grid and you're supposed to read it as such. White walls blank. Everybody knows white walls are not objective. They're new to art. It's a statement in itself, but it's code for flexible objective space in one sense. So the Zoomter building is supposed to be I think it's supposed to be felt. So hopefully you look at this thing and it is, it has no facade, it's weird and organic. Why would you have windows on the outside of a museum? And then you go into very intimate spaces. So theoretically, even the organization of the gallery should have a subliminal or an emotional feeling that would be conducive to understanding an art history that's not linear. So I would argue that the truth of art history is a non-linear history. It's made of crisscrossing lines, cul-de-sacs, changes, that, that, the, that the Cartesian order, front, back, left, right, does not apply, actually. You can try to fit it in those boxes so that by going into a building that doesn't have that and is not that, you should already be prepped for an art history and not want to pursue an art history that's linear. Does that make sense? So I feel the, the hope is that it's readable in a more emotional, subliminal way that is exactly a frame for a new attitude. And that if you're an architectural historian or critic, they could unpack the reading for us. Um, and we talk about it that way. You know, for a while I didn't show pictures of the building, so it didn't matter what it looked like. Because it was just supposed to be read in a certain way and you hand the problem to the architect and assume that's the architect's problem to have it be read with this sort of philosophy. Um, so um, I don't know if that's, that answers your question, but I mean, I, we have an, ob so this is the thing. Everybody wants to tell me the building, it's all about the art. So you should make uh, you know, a building that doesn't matter or is invisible and it's like that. And I keep saying, no, 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 there's no such thing as that. Every decision you make from what you see first, how you get off in your car, what does the entrance look like, is it Cecil B. DeMille, Egypt? Is it, is it uh, <laughs> modernist clarity? All those things are preparation for seeing, and they're going to affect how you see. So you have to take total responsibility for it. And um, there is no such thing as objectivity in that sense at all. So I guess it's just a question of which subjectivity you choose. And this is a very conscious choice to put side by side Cartesian 20th century read objective 
And it, I joke with Sumter, it's like a primordial modernism that's supposed to feel like some from someplace else, not uh, exactly. I don't know if that's, so you should be able to read that. Yeah, yeah, that's the short answer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Other questions? I mean, I'll, I would just say, I think, you know, it, it, I think the, I like the vision, but I also think it puts a lot of pressure on the curatorial uh, implementation because if you have, you could still have curators that are not capacious or not, you know, are not thinking alongside that vision, and and you know the mixing could also produce another form of hierarchy. Mixing, mixing uh, you so could mix with hierarchy, create hierarchy if, through if mixing. I'm, if I'm a curator who was curating under the kind of hierarchical view of painting, sculpture, periods, this and that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm saying, you know, you have to collaborate with architecture and, you know, look at a certain period using painting and architecture. You could still have a curator that doesn't have the capacity to, um, to entertain um, that collaboration in a way that would, that would be right. up to date. Agreed. But, so yeah. curatorial practice also has right. advanced yeah. and is pretty sophisticated. I mean, curators are amazing. They, they have ways of thinking that wouldn't have been possible previously because all that new experience changes. But you don't have to because the way it's structured again, um, the Resnick Pavilion, and Fred knows this because he worked on it, was take a horizontal plane, make individual sections, show diverse things in them, make it not. We know that if you don't think you like Japanese art, you're not going to take an elevator or an escalator to go to that floor. Just like you're not going to go to the women's shoe floor if you're not looking for shoes. And, but if it's around, if it's flat, it's free, and you just have to take two steps, I can't tell you the number of emails I got from artist friends about the Central Asian ECAT textile show. And they were like, never looked at that before. <laughs> because but it wow, it was cool. And that was a very narrow slice of art history contained. And so the way the building works is you can do a show, not that you would want it, but you know, in an inner space in one of those chapel galleries with artificial light and one door. Right. It's our job and we do this through the whole museum to make sure that the totality then of what curators want to do are timed and organized in a way that's diverse overall in an exhibition program, right? First of all, I just want to say how truly visionary your, um, your, your thoughts and your thoughts come out tonight. I hope you can get out through the city and do more of this because I think it really is extremely revealing. I'm digging what you think. And um, I think putting it in the context of the 19th century idea of the encyclopedic museum, every one of them had to be a Beaux-Arts building, you had to go up the steps, they all kind of had a way of revealing themselves, which was, that makes our city. If we had that, if we had that Beaux-Arts building in there, yeah. we would recognize it as us having come of age in some kind of way. What I think is remarkable and visionary about what you're doing with this one is, first of all, allowing if there are any future encyclopedic museums to be built, for there to be a kind of freedom to think about them living in this kind of different kind of horizontal and <coughs> complex world that right. we live in. And I truly believe we might see more. The, the easy thing is to say there'll be no more encyclopedic museums. But I think as we enter into a period of, um, of restitution, mm -hmm. I think we're going to start seeing that works will not necessarily uh, be traded for ownership. Right. There might be exchanges yes. that could be very, very serious. In Africa, we're going to start seeing a desire for universal museums. And the Getty might give back yes. something, but you know what? They might have to give a yes. Rubens to Africa, and before you know it, they're building an encyclopedic museum. What you're doing is going to allow for an analysis that would allow it to be of African <coughs> Right. Right. So anyway, I think that this has ramifications and implications that are very big for theory and for practice in terms of. Well, I just, just kind of, you're, you, one thing you're saying, which is very true, if you look at the broad history of art museums of where we are in the present, is this collection centric. This is your treasure. Here's where it is in the cabinet. This is what I have. We live in a programming centric world where people want to see interpretation and multiple perspectives and change. So 
what you're, so that's sort of part of what's underneath this too, and that the future encyclopedic museums may be made out of, and I hate that word, but those general museums may be made out of loans that are constantly changing, and that's going to happen with us. And as you, yes, you don't own those objects. Sorry, and you have a one in the few in the back too. Uh, David, your critics. You've had a lot of critics. Really. <laughs> <laughs> and if I Not so many. Paraphrase it. Why didn't you just recycle all these old buildings, put glass, whatever, in very creative ways? You did it beautifully at the at the DFB. Yeah. Right. Why not that kind of approach? Uh, two reasons. Um, well, one, I tried. I actually thought, I had this weird metaphor that the old buildings were so confusing and so hard to navigate that they might actually flow into this idea. <laughs> <laughs> but if you do the statistic count, only a fraction of people go to the top floor of that building. And so you had this, and I know somebody criticized me and says, elevator floors don't make hierarchy. And I was like, actually they do. We know because we have the counts of the people that they don't go to that floor and they don't see the Islamic arts on that floor. Or if you put the modern art up there, it doesn't even change it that much. So one is that the building circulation system was considered pretty unworkable and we tried to look at the Hardy Holzman Pfeiffer plan. And then the estimates came in and you'll appreciate this. And this is something I had to learn. On the East Coast, renovate a building, it's cheap. On the West Coast, under seismic code, it's orders of magnitude different. And when we did the estimates, the visible external damage that had to be repaired and divert maintenance was about 250 to 350 million. And we hadn't even calculated the full issue of how we would bring the existing buildings to code. So there was really a very, very deep problem that we were looking at $400 million. Now, I'm the fundraiser, and not a nickel, even today, even by my critics, not a nickel has been thrown my way to go the other direction. So you have both the practice of if you spent 450 or 500 million dollars on those old buildings, would you get the buildings that represented the value system and the beauty and power of today's Los Angeles? And then where would you get the money? Because the county said absolutely not too. When we, we, we raised that question with the county who owns the buildings, don't look at us, we're not doing that. So there was a very pragmatic approach and the trustees up until 2014 looked at that the viability of that option and it was not viable for those many reasons, if it makes sense. True. Uh, so I'm the director of the Heritage Conservation Program here. So as you can imagine, that question is perfectly uh, in line with what I was going to, one of the things I was going to ask you about. Uh, but I won't, I won't harp on that. I think it's a terrible decision to carry the bird over the um, I am interested in um, your involvement with Watts Towers and the recent acquisition of the Sheets Goldstein House by John Lochner and sort of your vision for these sort of, uh, are these, do these fit into your satellite vision of the campus and how do you envision uh, additional buildings as artifacts acquired in the future? Um. Sure, uh, just half a note on that. If the Pereira buildings existed intact, they would be saved, I am 100% sure. You know, they've been cut into, changed, the pools are gone. So a real question exists about what is it and what have you preserved. Even Pereira didn't like what happened to the interior. So I think you just, there's just real, I am a preservationist. We are, the Goff building is the opposite. It's intact, it actually, it's difficult to use, but it's intact, and it's a piece of history, and so we're pouring tons of money into it. So this idea of preserving what's intact and in to, has integrity for the history of LA and understanding the built environment is exactly what Watts Tower. So Watts Tower's pieces are falling off. They, people weren't even marking where they fell. So it was in a it wasn't a tough place, and, and so the city talked to us. I mean, I had been very vocal about their importance, and the city talked to us about whether we would be serious about partnering, and so for, I think, eight and a half years, it's been a long, complicated, expensive study and conservation effort 
we don't own the Watts Towers. <laughs> we don't operate them. Um, it was just a feeling, if not us, who else? It's been millions of dollars. So they are such a magnificent thing. They're so powerful for Los Angeles. Um, so it seems so important just to do. I don't know if it's like we imagine it as a satellite, because I don't even know if we'll have anything to do with it when it's restored. But it does start to, it is the same impulse that you don't have to define the museum by the boundary of the fence. So same thing as when I was looking for um, uh, somebody said to me, they knew how much I loved architecture. When I got to LA, the board said, oh, we're going to buy this famous house and restore it and you'll live there. And I was like, I don't know if it's the house to live in, but it's an amazing thing. And I didn't realize how many people didn't restore their Neutra, Lautner, whatever. It was shocking to me when I came to LA that these pieces of intact were torn down. I was like, how could you do that? So it just started the thought process. We put it out there, and, and James Goldstein was somebody who cared a lot about this house. He had spent his life on it. And um, a lot of people have offered to sell their houses to us. And I'm like, no, 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 it's kind of like a painting. You're supposed to give it <laughs> <laughs> with an endowment to take care of it. And so James raised his hand. He's like, I, 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 he it was a three-year conversation. It's a long agreement, but the idea is he did that. He said, I want to give you my Picasso and give you some money to take care of it. And, and so we are, he's not even finished with the sort of some of the pieces of it. So we've made this commitment and I put it out there that we as Los Angeles, I don't care, it could be anybody, it could be LACMA, it could be USC. We should. Some yeah. <laughs> I know. And I know it's hard. It's really hard. But I actually thought maybe museums are better, are best able because we have conservation departments. We have curators who are interested in those things. You can program with them. So the, the loose proposal is if, if we as a, as a metropolis could identify those historical sites, maybe we could start to build an infrastructure to care for them into the future. And so that's the modest proposal. And I've talked to a few other people about that. Okay. I really uh, appreciate the way you answered the first question in terms of the like, like, uh, One question that I had was it has almost this infrastructural quality to it, um, whether you take that as good or bad, but is the group of the exam is it sort of discontinuous? Yeah, so that's a good question. So we, you know, everybody says, why don't you have a green roof up there in a the park? Um, and some people do that, but the way the museum's structured, it's opening quite a bit of open space underneath it for connectivity. And then the idea of the roof, um, yes, we have all the water reclamation. And then the idea of the roof emerged, because it is very expensive and hard to create those. You need egress, access, rails. And if you're just below, you have the same view pretty much, of the tar pits and the Wilshire Boulevard. So you don't get a different view. You have the La Brea tar pits gardens that are going to be improved. So the question is value of that. And we actually figured out that the, the highest value was probably to create a solar farm. Um, and as most people know, if you have a two-story building, and this is more than a two-story building, and it's a house, you can operate at zero energy. And whether we can get zero energy for this museum because it's climate controlled, et cetera, we're working on, but we're going to produce a huge amount of electricity um, on the roof. And we're hoping that we can, we're actually working with some companies at the solar panels. We have a plan for just rectangles in black, but we are working on other possibilities that might give it a different kind of image. But that was the idea that the highest, best use, most efficient in the total ecosystem of the La Brea Tar Pits and Park was that. A couple more questions. One here, then here, and then I'll go back there. Um, uh, well, actually, being honest, there was a lot of time in the middle of the process that was a struggle. Um, I have to say that, you know, it's a hard thing where artists or architects have to do their work with so much public scrutiny to every move of the pencil. Well, does it look like this? Did it cross the street this way? Did you have everybody? I liked it better before. It's, I mean, that's a really hard thing to have it all open to the public. So I, it was a struggle and there were times I had to be very positive about the building and I, I'm 
saying this, Peter Zimtor knows that there were aspects of it that didn't click. Um, however, I have to say that the resolved version, and again, renderings are ter you know how bad renderings are if you're an architect. Like, it's not really, those done by USC graduates. Not, not those done by USC <laughs> graduates. But it's, it's kind of clicked into an ideal uh, situation and you know we're, we're pretty happy with it I think even even the you know I always walk in my head the size could you see it all in a day could you have that experience and so we've been thinking a lot about the experiential quality of it and so I, I, I can be very honest that I'm super happy with it even though I'm only looking at plans and renderings and you'll never know how it feels until it's all done um, they were a lot, I mean, it's been a 10-year design process. And you know, it's something interesting. You take something like a museum that's as important as that, and usually the process is donor gives you the money, they want it built in two years. Road building is done in, like, money was there, had to do it, very simple. Um, people said in the 2008 financial crisis, what, you're planning a new museum? That's stupid, insane, what are you thinking? And it was partly because I thought, well, if there's an eight-year design process, the economy's gonna come back sometime, 10 years, the building will be better for it. Like, let it gestate, let it evolve. I happen to know a secret, too, that the last two museums that Peter Simtor did took 17 years. <laughs> I was like a little worried. Uh, so I, I actually am quite, there'll be surprises, right? Because you never know how it feels. No rendering, no fly-through will tell you how it feels. So I, I think that remains to be seen in part. But from the external design, the re resolution of problems and ideas, it's been really good. And especially as it got to the budget where it had to get, which was a hard thing. What did you say? So, quick commentary on some of the comments about the career of the buildings. I have a question. Just to tell you, you know, I was a student here in 1994. And even then, we were part of the career. Analysis of the, uh, of the, uh, the new edition at the time and the criticism of it. Um, yeah. There was, was already a pretty good dialogue. And, you know, like, right, it's uh, part of the fight for the edition. How does this get completely resolved? You know, so, uh, as a student, I don't know, really, it was kind of, I don't know, what it was. Um, so I, I, I respect both sides of it, but I think that you have a very solid vision. You have a very solid vision. And, and, and as a builder, I know very well what we call 120% of the model. Yes, we knew. How's you more? Yeah. And then the other way. So I respect that. But my question is you have a very clear vision. You came to vision. And that can be a vision. And you have an understanding of the history of the museum, those art building, the, the, what you described as the European museums. And sort of it turned out upside down. This is the vision of um, and just as clearly, I'm interested as, as, as what your vision is for the permanence of the future of this specific museum, the buildings around it, which may not have been part of the original plan. What does this look like? It's supposed to be. Well, we. we <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, by the way, there's also, you know, the building across the street is by Pereira from the 70s. That's where our office is, and it's a great building. It's a classic Pereira. Um, I love it. There's one in San Francisco that's kind of a copy of it. So we're going to live in a Pereira building, and we love it. Uh, I don't know. So, you know, somebody said to me in today's world, the average life of a building in L.A. is 30 years. So if they don't like it, they'll tear it down and build another one. Um, <laughs> The hope would be that it would not be, the hope is that it wouldn't be destroyed. I, I mean, the, the Hardy Holtzman, whether you like it or not, the Hardy Holtzman Pfeiffer buildings destroyed the Pereira buildings and all of their integrity. So it either had to be awesome, because that was when the, that was the fork in the road for Pereira buildings. So will people tear them down? Will it be a monument? The hope was, and the desire was, to build something that would be um, taken on by the community as something great and that the community would take care of it. You can't force that issue. Um, even when I put up Urban Light, I said to Chris Burden, look, 
I'm not telling you it's permanent, but I'm willing for it to be permanent. It's just sort of like, I don't know, like there's city code, there's building, there's trustees. I don't know if I can do that in LA. And of course now if I were to tear it down, the public <laughs> would be, so it's like, that's what you want. So the hope of course, and the dream, I think even of architects or anybody is that it becomes owned and cared for and you don't get the deferred maintenance that led to the Pereira buildings. Cause even they, the deferred maintenance, the problems with the pools, poorly making them led to their destruction. So we're trying to build the buildings well so that they will last a long time. And then the hope is, I really think that this organic shape, horizontal, looking out, looking in, changeable is a perfect centerpiece for this more malleable, changeable, flexible, multi-site vision of LACMA in the future. So the hope is that it becomes a, like the beating heart of that idea. One last question by Doug Noble. And love. Just intercede and say that um, in the case of the Folk Art Museum, it was the institution that, that kind of fell apart and then the building, right? So I mean, it's institutional, yeah. not just the integrity. Yeah, we balance our budget every year for 25 years, so hopefully that's, <laughs> that's not an issue. I came there expecting to be pretty unhappy with you. I get that a lot. Okay, feel free. Thank you for the Call snarky, now, snarky for comment. I'm happy for it. I mean, again, these are really hard. It's so hard to build something in a civic environment and get it done and make all these decisions and get the money raised. And it's like, you know, everybody knows that. It's, it, it's really hard. You're doing all these people. This is not just me. You know how many people poured their heart and soul and money into this. So we're trying our best. I mean, history will decide whether those were the right decisions. Um, the sound thing is a really key thing because if you've probably, maybe you've never been in a Peter Zumter building, but he's like a lunatic about that. And if you go into the Broad building, like a lot of buildings, it I drives me crazy. I can hear the air handling system. And I can hear the hum and the buzz. Forget the outside sound. How about the inside sound? So Zumter over his career has been obsessive about this notion of soundscape, even if it's not all quiet, because there's an aspect of resonance interior. <laughs> so today, I approved a use of the contingency in the design for the ultrasoundproof glass. <laughs> <laughs> to your comment, the floors are gonna be actually not terrazzo, but a kind of um, enough asphalt that's only done in Europe, but is very easy to do, that absorbs more sound and is softer. And there are a lot of holes poked in the ceiling. And then you saw the curtains that are being discussed with an artist collaboration. So a little resonance is kind of interesting for a public building, because it's not a private building. So, but <laughs> it's funny you should say that today. <laughs> Please join me in thanking so, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.